Good afternoon. First, I want to thank Dr. Halpern for inviting me to speak at the New York Medical College 164th commencement exercise. Is there a rumbling? Okay. Reverend members of the clergy, the chairman of the board of trustees, the officers of the college, the faculty, administrator, graduates, friends and families, it is indeed an honor and a privilege to address the over 200 graduates of this historic institution. As you all know, New York Medical College was founded in 1860 by William Cullen Bryant, the same Bryant who sits behind the New York Public Library on 46th, 42nd Street. And by my reading, Bryant was a poet. He was awful a suffragist, an abolitionist, and a proponent of organized labor. In fact, he was a modern day progressive, even though he labeled himself a liberal. And today, May 23rd, 2023, you follow his ideals. You are 56% women, 16% underrepresented minorities in medicine. 59% of you are from the tri-state area. 60% of you are staying in New York. 5% are going to California. 5% are going to Connecticut. And although I'm an OBGYN and only 6% of you are going into OBGYN, <laughs> I'll forgive you. 23% <laughs> of you are going into internal medicine and primary care is what we really need today for our population. 11% are going into PEDS. 9% are going into emergency medicine. 8% are going to take care of our mentally ill. 18% are going to take out our ruptured appendices and do our open heart surgery. 7% are going to provide the anesthesia for that open heart surgery. And 7% are going to read those images that we rely on to make our di diagnoses. I have to say, you've been brave, you've been resilient over the past four years. You showed up at your clinical rotations during the horrific COVID-19 pandemic. You've witnessed the reversal of Roe versus Wade. You've witnessed great political divisiveness and social upheaval. And every day you're watching the arrival of hundreds of asylum seekers and the growing number of unhoused mentally ill in our city. You watched on social media the death of George Floyd and of Jordan Neely on the F train. And on top of all of that emotional toil, this has placed you and your families at enormous financial debt in order to arrive, arrive here today. When I asked Chancellor Halperin why he chose to invite me to give the commencement address, he said he thought I might have an interesting story to tell, but I must warn you, when I tell stories in my, ham in my family, my son all of a sudden has to run to the grocery store. <laughs> my husband is polite enough to fall asleep without running out the house. But let me attempt to share my story. It's a story of purpose, and gratitude. We lived in Washington, D.C. for the first two years of my life, and from there we lived to New York City, and from there there are a host of schools I attended. Mother Cabrini High School up by the Cloisters, Cornell University. Oh, by the way, in 1969 I participated in the armed turkover, takeover of the Student Union at Cornell. Then University of California, San Francisco for medical school, San Francisco General Hospital for an internal medicine in internship, Einstein Jacoby for OBGYN, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center for Maternal Fetal Medicine Fellowship, and then I started working. <laughs> I worked at Harlem Hospital, I worked with the New York City Department of Health, I worked at Bellevue Hospital. 
I spent over 20 years at Bellevue as an obstetrician on labor and delivery. I established a prenatal program for women who were chemically dependent, i.e. addicted, and at risk for AIDS. However, while I was there, I got a phone call for someone who said she was seeing my clients, she was seeing my patients as her clients. This was an extraordinary opportunity to collaborate with Terry McGovern, Esquire, an activist lawyer at that time working at the HIV Law Project in the East Village. In 1989, we successfully brought a class action suit against the United States Health and Human Services to broaden the Social Security Administration's definition of AIDS, which previously excluded those definitions that pertained to women in the lexicon of age diagnoses that was cervical dysplasia. And ultimately, I joined the senior leadership at the New York City Health and Hospitals. And was mentioned earlier, in 2013, I accepted the offer to be deputy CMO of the h and system. I had a purpose, and the purpose in accepting that offer was to be on the ground when Barack Obama implemented his Affordable Care Act. I wanted to learn what on earth it would be like to implement the ACA in the largest municipal hospital center in the country. It's still a learning experience. Now I'm fully aware that I am the highest ranking African American in a very large municipal health system. However, I am looking directly at you. I do not want to be the only. I don't want to be the last. And while indeed it is an honor to hold this title, but more importantly, it is a tremendous responsibility. And I will need one of you or some of you to rise up and replace me. I'd like to spend the next few minutes sharing with you the importance of purpose in one's life and the decisions one makes in life. To quote Colin Powell, a New York City kid from the Bronx, a product of the New York City public school systems, a product of CUNY, the former National Security Advisor, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and former Secretary of State, he said, quote, Purpose is the destination of a, of a vision. Let me repeat that again. Purpose is the definition of a vision. It energizes that vision. It gives it force, gives it drive. And it should be positive and powerful and serve our better angels. So let's rewind and start all over again. What was the purpose of my parents' decision to leave Washington, D.C. and come to New York? Well, this is a secret. I was born before 1954. I was born before the landmark Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board of Ed. I was born before the Supreme Court ruled that separate educations were inherently unequal. And at the time I was born, the Washington DC public school system was in fact separate. And my parents made the pur purposeful decision that my education was paramount. They decided to move to New York City when I was two. At that time, the New York City parochial school education was among the best in the nation for the price. And Mother Cabrini in Washington Heights was definitely not segregated. My classmates were the daughters of the blue collar Italians, Irish, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, African Americans, an Eastern European girl whose surname was Mohorovic, a South American girl from Venezuela, Pilar. But let me tell you one thing, we all could Latin dance before salsa was a word. <laughs> we could swing. My best friend in second grade was Kathleen Moran. Her, her red hair shouted, Erin Gobra. And in fifth grade, Lorraine Scaringi was my best friend. 
Her father owns an Italian restaurant on Arthur Street in the Bronx. In eighth grade, Judy Betancourt was my best friend and her father was a carpenter from Cuba. Now my parents had a definite purpose in moving to New York and that was to give me the best education opportunity they can. However, when I applied to Cornell, I had absolutely no purpose. What I did not realize at that time was that I was the living fruits of my mother's wisdom. She often said, check every box which may represent an opportunity for you. And as many of you know, the New York educational system has a board of regents whose exams you must, must pass in order to get a Regents High School diploma. Well, in the 10th grade, this test comes with a checkbox, many checkboxes. Do you want to be considered for this scholarship? Do you want to be considered for that scholarship? Well, I checked the box for the Cornell scholarship. So I had to apply. Yes, I did get accepted, and yes, I did get the scholarship. And yes, I did participate in 1969 in the armed takeover of the student union. So that you and generations that followed can have exposure to African American history and culture. Then it was time to apply to medical school and once again, I can't tell you I had a purpose in making that decision. I'd never been to California. I didn't know a thing about UCSF. A campus recruiter tried to sell me on UC Davis, but I applied to UCSF. UCSF. Well, why? Because I wanted to live in San Francisco. Big Sur, Yosemite, the Redwoods. But oh, by the way, I met the two most beautiful people on the planet who have become my lifelong friends. However, I can tell you about the next decision I made in my life, which was very purposeful and probably the most dis best decision I ever made. While I was at San Francisco General as an intern, my father died at site St. Luke's Hospital here in New York. And my mother had told me the entire time he was ill to stay in California, and she would give me a call to tell me when it was time to come home, which she did. One day she called the hospital and said, come home and bring a black dress. I was by his side the next day in the hospital when his breathing slowed, his pulse slowed, and yet no one called the cardiac arrest team. So, little Miss Smarty Pants, I called his geriatrician and said, where's the code team? And he said, Michelle, this is part of life. Death and dying are part of the natural progression of life. I had spent my whole postgraduate life learning how to save lives, how to do CPR, how to intubate, how to float catheters to measure heart function, how to save and prolong life, but I knew nothing about the dignity of death. I only knew acute care medicine. I spent the next year looking for my purpose in medicine, and that's when I realized my purpose needed to be personal and sustaining over a lifetime. Beyond the fleeting selfish pride of learning a new procedure or using a new tool or being the best at some new thing, <clears throat> my life had to have purpose, my work had to have purpose, and that for me was a political purpose. I've since devoted my career to providing health care to women, specifically marginalized women, women at the highest risk of maternal morbidity and maternal death. I'd like to close this address with a thought on gratitude, reflecting on my parents. Now my father was raised in Meridian, Mississippi. His father, my grandfather, was an educator in Meridian in the early 1900s. Now I had never been to Mississippi, never mind Meridian, until two years ago. My husband decided to plan a road trip so that I could see the place where my grandparents raised their five children. We traveled from New Orleans to Birmingham by way of Mississippi to Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative. And we did stop in Meridian as we crossed 
Mississippi into Alabama. What I found in Meridian was a school named after my grandfather, the Thomas Page Harris Lower School. In fact, unknown to me, my grandfather had taught at the All Black Agricultural School in Meridian, which became a community college in the 1930s. At that time, colleges for, were for whites. Agricultural schools were for blacks. It was not until we arrived in Birmingham at the, Lex at the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice that I came to realize that my grandfather was teaching black folks how to read and pursue a higher education at the very same time black folks were being lynched simply for knowing how to read. I also learned that James Cheney who in 1964 was shot and murdered at the age of 21 in Philadelphia, Mississippi by the Ku Klux Klan, along with Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner for registering black folks to vote during that Freedom Summer. I learned that James, James Cheney was also from Meridian and most likely had been a student in my grandfather's school. Now my father received a college degree from a historically black college and university. He went to Tugaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi. However, when he moved north during the Great Migration, every help wanted sign was followed by sorry, no jobs available. So he spent his years in New York as a shipping clerk on 14th Street. Now what does a shipping clerk do? He loads boxes onto trucks. However, my childhood memory of him is his leaving the house every morning with a suit jacket and a fedora. A proud man, a handsome man, a distinguished man. He had a job where he showed up every day until he retired, not a single sick day. And my mom received his pension that says to me, William Bryant, the founder of this institution, who believed in a unionized workforce, benefited my father while his college education did not. However, it benefited me. Now my mother, my mother always aspired to be a teacher and she combined a native brilliance with common sense in a way I've never seen or met anyone with as much wisdom as she. Unfortunately, her own mother died when she was five months old, and her subsequent guardian died when she was 17 years old, and that was the end of her formal education. However, they both, my mother and my father, as unlikely a match as you could find in any couple, she a feisty fighter and he a calm, circumspect man, they both valued education. And the sole purpose of their combined lives was to ensure my education, to ensure I would reap the benefits of that education. Their own personal dreams were deferred. However, I am their deferred dream. Their dream became my reality. And while I fought kicking and screaming against conformity, fought for my independence, fought for my autonomy, to do things my way, my parents' purpose provided direction for their vision, such that today, two generations later, the dream that they dared to pursue with purpose and conviction is evident in their granddaughter, a lawyer in cor corporate philanthropy, and their grandson, a published poet. And I am who I am today, and an embodiment of both my past and my future. My mother's feisty fight and my father's calm circumspection have given me a life I value deeply. And my children give me texture and wisdom. I've had an education forged by my grandfather who opened doors through which I have taken flight. Several things I want you to remember. Love is a verb and the people in the back love you as a verb. 
optimism is a choice. And to commemorate the NBA playoffs, play hard in the paint <laughs> with defiance and resilience. And if you fail along the way, get up and dust yourself off because good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. And before we end, I'd like to recognize the parents, grandparents, godparents, siblings, spouses, partners, children, friends, everyone who showed up here to celebrate you. But I'm gonna ask you to do two things. I'm gonna ask the graduates, all of you, to stand up now. Turn around and face your parents, your godparents, your grandparents, your siblings, your partners, your spouses, your children, your friends, and give them a standing ovation. And congratulate Congratulations to you, the doctors who are graduating today from New York Medical College, class of 2023. I thank you.